Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and get this kicked off. We, uh, we'll try to make this short and sweet for everyone today. It's not a, a whole terrible ton of stuff that we need to get out there to you, but we do want to make sure that you understand the impending deadlines and a few things that can help you save some taxes before the end of the year. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's not going to take the full hour, um, but I'm certainly happy to sit here and answer any questions that you may have. But um, without any further delay, let's go ahead and get started. If it wants to advance my slide. My name is Alex Perney. I'm a certified IRA services professional here at Advanta IRA. I've been doing this since the beginning of 2012. So I have a lot of experience with uh, different changes in tax law, different uh, types of investments that clients have done, different strategies. I've seen a lot of different things and I hope to impart that to you here today with at least some of the <clears throat> very salient points with regard to end of year tax planning strategies, what you need to know, what can help you save on some taxes and what kind of options you have out there for getting these things done by the end of the year, or maybe that you don't even have to do some of these by the end of the year and you can free up a little bit of your time to spend with your families or uh, other other items that you need to get done before the end of the year as well. Because although there are some definite deadlines, some people may be under the impression that some things have to be done uh, when, they, when they maybe don't have to be. A few key points that I really want people to take away from here today is that there's not one single plan that's going to work well for everyone. You know, you don't just have to select, oh, well, I can only use the IRA or the Roth IRA or the 401k. Uh, there might be a few different ways that you can uh, game this to best suit your personal taxable situation and to maximize your contributions for the given year in which you're looking to make them. I really need you to understand the deadlines that are coming up because although some things you are going to be able to do into the new year, there are some things that you are going to have to get accomplished by years and or at least essentially sign on the dotted line committing to do something by the stroke of midnight on December 31st. Um, and there's essentially there's no real way to backdate some of this stuff. It is very uh, concrete in its in its deadline. And then what some of the things that are going to be concerning Roth conversions and 401ks as these are the two accounts that are going to have the most impending deadlines and material that you're going to need to understand how it works before the end of the year uh, essentially crosses. And just again, to, before we get too far into it, make sure that you type in any questions that you might have as microphone audio is muted on the attendee side. If you have any questions and you want an in-office consultation, feel free to drop by our Florida or Atlanta office. We're located in uh, Largo, Florida, down here in the Clearwater St. Pete area, and then we are just north of the perimeter in Atlanta, but <clears throat> all of this can be taken care of on the phone as well. I'm more than happy to set up consultations. Uh, I will be here uh, throughout all of the high holidays coming up as well as up to the new year as well. So if you have any questions you need to get a consultation, feel free to reach out to me directly and I can certainly get you scheduled uh, as I will be here um, in the office. So this is some stuff that you really don't need. You need to start thinking about it now. Uh, it's something that you cannot necessarily put off for much longer. Um, not everything can be done after the first of the year. Most people are going to be familiar with <clears throat> the ability to make a contribution into a retirement plan for the previous year. And most people, when they go through things like TurboTax or uh, whatever tax filing software you use, or even your CPA or someone may say, hey, you know, before we file your taxes by the timely filing deadline or an extended deadline, uh, let's make a contribution to a retirement plan. Typically, that's going to be an IRA of some type, either that be a Roth traditional or SEP or in some rare cases, a simple IRA. Now, this is all well and good for most types of contributions. Now, I say contributions specifically because that does not include Roth conversions, which is when you take monies from a traditional type account, whether that be a 401k, a traditional IRA, a SEP component, or a simple IRA, elect to pay the taxes and move it into a Roth IRA. There is no such thing as a previous year Roth conversion. And with the tax law changes of 2017, there are now no longer recharacterizations, meaning that if you do a Roth conversion, it is concrete and cannot be unwound. So making sure that you have good advice on the feasibility of this for your personal taxable situation is very important. Now, with regard to being able to make these contributions, you need to understand a few key points. 
that with Roth or traditional IRAs, you don't necessarily need to have the accounts open in that given year to make a contribution for a previous year. <clears throat> TurboTax, uh, which is what I personally use to do most of my uh, tax filing, I will say, hey, have you opened up a retirement account? Let's, let's open one up and make a previous year contribution to help reduce some of your taxes. Now, that's all well and good, and with Roth and traditional and SEP accounts, you can establish a plan and then make a previous year contribution up until your filing deadline. Now, the important thing to remember with regard to Roth and traditional IRAs is that <clears throat> you can make that contribution up until your filing deadline, but even if you do file an extension for a Roth or traditional, you cannot make a contribution after the 15th of April or the applicable deadline thereof after. You have to at least make those contributions by the national timely filing deadline. Now, <clears throat> making a contribution for a previous year may be great, but I always recommend people, and I think it's pretty sound uh, guidance, is that if you have the money, especially with the end of the year coming up and you're trying to budget for everything, go ahead and start putting a little bit of that away before the end of the year. It's not too early to kind of say, hey, let's segment this out. Let's put some ahead in the retirement it's gonna be counted this year. Uh, you can also count it next year, but it gives you a little bit of extra flexibility to already have gone ahead and put some of that money away. And then you can easily, and then you can more clearly budget for things like holiday expenses, whether that is travel or gifts or, or what have you, you can make those kind of elections then. Now keep in mind that when you do a Roth conversion, you are not going to be having to pay those taxes at the time of the conversion, you pay that when you file your taxes for that given year, and those are paid personally. So it comes out of your personal funds and not necessarily the, <clears throat> the funds that you are converting. I saw someone just raise their hand. Uh, if you do have a question, uh, please type that in and I will be more than happy to address that. Thank you. So this kind of covers um, what it is. Oh, oh, here we go with the question typed in. Okay. Fang asked, I'll be 59 and a half in August of 2020. Can I convert my IRA to Roth IRA in January 2020? Or do I have to wait until August? Uh, great question. There's a couple different pieces of that. Let's break it down. So the individual is asking, since they will be 59 and a half in August, can they do a Roth conversion? Well, the 59 and a half has nothing to do with your ability to do a conversion. That has to do with your ability to take penalty-free distributions from an IRA. Now, this is a great age because you get rid of the 10% excise tax penalty associated with distributions from traditional type retirement accounts or the earnings from a Roth, because remember, your contributions to a Roth are always distributable tax and penalty free. Now, if you would like to do a conversion, you do not have to wait <clears throat> until you are going to be 59 and a half. You can convert your IRA at any time that you would like. Um, I personally am 30 years old and I've done several Roth conversions over the past years to try to uh, maximize my deductions in years where I had potentially higher earnings and convert in years in which I had lower earnings and had more available room in my applicable tax bracket. Now, if you want to do a Roth conversion, it is only going to be counted in the in the dates of January 1 to December 31 of a given year, meaning that the <clears throat> amount of liability you are going to incur is going to be based in that year. So if you do a Roth conversion this year of $10,000, so you take $10,000 from a traditional account, move $10,000 into that Roth account, you're going to then in turn claim an additional $10,000 of ordinary income on your 1040 tax return, which means it will just adjust your modified adjusted gross income or MAGI up by that $10,000. And then all of your applicable tax credits, deductions, losses, or anything else that would affect that bottom line MAGI will be counted against that amount of additional income. So unfortunately <clears throat> with this, if you convert your Roth IRA in January, 2020, uh, it will be counted in that given year, and you do not have to wait until August to do so. So although we did expound upon your question, essentially at the end of the day, you don't have to wait till you're 59 and a half. So you can convert either this year if you'd like to count it in this taxable year, because remember that has to be done by December 31st in order to have it counted in this taxable year, 
or you can do it at any time in 2020. It is not date specific tied to the age of 59 and a half. Ah, oh, Randy, great question. <clears throat> is there a max amount you can convert from solo 401k non Roth to Roth? The answer is no, there is no limit. In the tax revisions of 2005, all limits on Roth conversion amounts were stricken from the tax code, which means that it does not matter if you want to convert $1,000, $10,000, or $10 million, with irregard to the amount of money you make, you can always do a conversion. Now, what he is asking with regards to a 401k or solo 401k for that matter, means that you are electing to take your deductible contributions, whether that be your elective deferral of compensation or your profit sharing match into that plan, and then move it into a Roth component, meaning that it will grow tax exempt for the remainder of its life because you have elected to pay taxes at your current taxable rate. Now, you can do this in a few different ways. You can look at a conversion as you're converting the profit sharing of that plan because you don't always necessarily have to make your elective deferral compens elective compensation deferrals into that plan as deductible. So you can either make it as a Roth contribution to that plan of up to $19,000 per year, an additional six if you're over 50 and a half, and then leave the deductible portion in there of profit sharing or you can start doing conversions of the profit sharing. There's a bunch of different strategies with that, and I've, I've taught a few classes on it as well, but great question. So to circle back to the initial question, no, there is no uh, maximum amount. You can do as much or as little as you like. So Fang has a follow-up question, but if I convert in January 2020 before I am 59 and a half, will I have to pay the 10% penalty? Great question. So when you're talking about the 10% excise tax penalty of early distributions from a retirement plan, that is going to be specific only to the money that you take out personally. When you do a conversion, there is no distribution of funds, although you are paying taxes in, a cent, in essence as if you had taken funds out of it, you are still keeping them within a qualified retirement plan, so there are no taxes or a 10% penalty to be ass assessed. So the 10% early distribution penalty would not apply because you can do Roth conversions at any time in your life, whether you are under 59 and a half or over, because it's not an actual distribution. It's going from one retirement plan to another. It just happens to be a taxable event. Great questions. This is exactly why I like doing these. It's, it's good to keep uh, the questions coming in. So I believe the next slide, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this because this is where it's going to be really important to understand the amounts and when you can do these types of contributions. So with traditional and Roth IRAs, you have six or seven thousand dollars of contrib contributable amounts that you can make in a given year, <clears throat> depending on your age, whether or not you are over or under the age of 50 and a half. Now, these can be made up until your timely filing deadline. So up until April 15th. It does not matter if you file an extension, you <clears throat> you can only make your contributions for a previous year up until the national filing deadline. Now, if you made a traditional IRA contribution this year and you'd like to maybe instead make that as a Roth, you kind of have two different options with that. So let's say you're an individual over the age of 50 and a half and you contributed $7,000 back in March. Well, let's say you'd like to actually make that as a Roth contribution. You can either convert it and just claim it as additional income for that given year, or you can have it distributed as current year contribution. So you can just have it a removal of contribution for that given year, and then just contribute that to a Roth IRA directly. I would more think that the Roth conversion is a little bit cleaner and the taxes aren't going to be any different uh, essentially because you got a $7,000 deduction for that contribution. And then essentially you would just be getting uh, an offsetting $7,000 of additional income claimed for the conversion. So you'd have a negative 7,000 on your taxes and a positive 7,000. So it essentially would be a net zero for any type of taxable increase or applicable modified adjusted gross income um, adjustment. Now the SEP IRA has a salary deferral portion with regard to how you contribute to that plan. Now, this one's really nice because you don't have to worry about SEP contributions until your extended filing deadline for your corporation if you've established a SEP. A SEP is a simplified employer pension plan, which allows individuals that have one associated with their business to contribute up to 25% of their compensation, not to exceed $55,000 to the plan, 
in a given year, in addition to the traditional IRA contribution of six or seven thousand dollars. Now, this fifty-five thousand dollars of maximum contribution can be made to the SEP IRA up until the October filing deadline for extensions for corporations. <clears throat> now, the nice thing about SEP IRAs is that you can also use this in conjunction with Roth conversion strategies, but you need to make that contribution before you do the Roth conversion, because Roth conversions can only be done for the given year in which they occur. Even if you are making a previous year SEP contribution, that SEP contribution for the previous year can then only be converted and reported in the given year in which you did that. So let's say I had made a $55,000 SEP contribution for 2018 in October of this year. And let's say I wanted to then in turn convert that contribution that I had made for 2018 to a Roth IRA. I am certainly allowed to do that. There is no seasoning for how long it has to stay in the SEP IRA. I can immediately convert it if I want to. However, even though I received a deduction on my taxes for the given year of 2018, the conversion of that $55,000 SEP contribution will be counted on my personal income statement as additional income for the year of 2019. Same thing goes if you were to count convert in 2020, it would be counted against your 2020 taxable liability for that year. And it would be personal because the $55,000 is a corporate deduction and you are taking it as a conversion to pay the taxes personally. So it's important to note where those taxable deductions and liabilities are going to be associated with when especially talking about conversions of SEP and 401k accounts. <clears throat> Simple IRAs are in my opinion, a horrible acronym for a very complicated plan with low flexibility. Uh, but if you are participating in one, uh, they, they have these same rules you can convert, but it is going to be a given year in which you convert, not the contribution year that you're looking at. Now, 401ks are going to be something that <clears throat> has a lot of deadlines coming up. And with the attractiveness of these plans and the popularity of them, it is something very important for those of you that either are sole proprietors, are self-employed, maybe you have a side business in addition to your regular nine to five. If you have any type of income that is derived from a business activity outside of your normal job or you are self-employed, you can typically establish a solo 401k. And with these being the only other type of plan besides a Roth IRA that allows a Roth component, there are a lot of very important things to understand with this. So with a 401k plan, let's say you had something from as mundane as selling widgets on eBay to something as involved as owning a, a, a being a high paid consultant. Uh, that consults out to the tech industry, but you are still self-employed and generating income on your personal activities. You can have a solo 401k account, which is going to allow you to contribute, and you can be covered by multiple solo 401k accounts. The only, the only limiting factor is the amount of money you can contribute out of your pay, so what you are paying Social Security and Medicare on, uh, what you can contribute out of those balances. Uh, let's see what this question Ooh, interesting question. All right, Arnold asked, how is inherited IRA are required minimum distributions for year after death determined if the deceased paid a required minimum distribution in the year of death, died, and the RMD uh, was paid in November 2018 went to beneficiaries in 2019? Okay, so the way that this works, um, although this is a little bit of a, a tangent, I, I do find this very interesting. So if you have, an individual that dies and they have a required minimum distribution for that account. So they are over the age of 70 and one half. Then they pass away after taking the, they die after, and uh, Dale, that's a good question. We'll get right back into that once we jump back into the uh, 401k uh, contributions. So they've taken the required minimum distribution and then they die. Um, Sorry, I was just trying to get my thoughts on this. Um, <clears throat> they, they paid the RMD in the year that they died. Then they will still have an RMD in the subsequent year. Now, inherited IRAs also have required minimum distributions. But if the decedent's estate is not settled and that account is still in existence, it's still going to have required minimum distributions. 
then you can pay those either to the estate and have it be calculated as a probate amount for the value of the probate, or you can establish a beneficiary IRA and then let them all um, calculate the required minimum distributions on their individual life expectancies. Because if you do it as being distributable to the estate, then you are going to use the oldest beneficiaries life expectancy to calculate, which might inherently cause more distribution, a higher amount of distributions to those individuals uh, that are younger. Okay, Dale asked, just to be clear, self-employed income from Schedule C qualifies for a solo 401k. Yes, um, but it's going to kind of, that's a little bit more of an involved question. So what he's asking there for individuals, typically you file earned income, so income from an activity that you perform to earn earn money uh, on Schedule C of your 1040. Now, this is what most people are going to kind of use as a catch-all for saying, hey, if you file money on Schedule C, then you are able to contribute that to a retirement plan, and especially if you're self-employed, yes, Schedule C does qualify. But there are gonna be two different parts of a solo 401k contributions that are going to need to be looked at <clears throat> with regard to how you factor in your contributions. So to the Schedule C question, Dale, you are going to look at the $19,000 if you're under the age of 50 and a half of income that you receive or the additional six if you're over 50 for qualifying for that portion of the contribution. And this is going to be the limiting factor if you are covered by multiple 401ks. So as I said, if you're covered, let's say you work for uh, Microsoft nine to five and then you flip houses as a S Corp um, in your spare time, then that, that $19,000 being contributed to the plan of salary deferral is the max total that you can do. You can't do $19,000 for each plan. Uh, you can only you can only participate in multiple amounts of profit sharing. So the $19,000 has to be earned income, has to be on Schedule C or in some cases Schedule E, depending on the activity for the uh, qualification of those contributions. Now <clears throat> that is going to be a deferral of your personal pay. Now, depending on how you pay yourself out of these businesses, that could be also calculated as net operating income. It can be calculated a bunch of different ways, but that is the amount of money that you are taking home that you would like to pay into that plan. To kind of bring that down to a much more relatable level, when you look at your paycheck, if you're covered by an employer-sponsored plan presently, if you work for any number of people that have a 401k, when you look at your paycheck and it shows your contribution to a 401k, that is the salary deferral. The technical term is the elective deferral because you're electing to defer a portion of your compensation into that plan. <clears throat> now a plan for a 401k and especially with a solo 401k has another component where you can contribute up to 25% of the net operating income of that business up to $35,000 per year <laughs> into that plan. Now that is always going to be made traditional and you can also, as I said, have a Roth portion of this because you can either claim a deduction or not claim a deduction for the 19 or 30, 35 or, or $25,000 that you put in out of your own personal pay. So to kind of bring this in a streamlined manner, you can take $25,000 of the pay that you have in your self-employed business and either take a deduction or not, making it a Roth or traditional 401k, if you took the deduction or not. And then if you want to also and then in turn convert your employer match, so that up to $35,000 or 25% of the NOI, you can convert that as well. Now, where it gets a little bit tricky is that you can make that $19,000 um, contribution of into that plan up until January 31st of the following year, but you can only count the conversion in the given year. So even though you can take the salary, so even though you can make the profit sharing contribution much later, if you want to convert that, then you would need to uh, do that do that much earlier than your extended filing deadline for that. I've got a good, bunch of good questions rolling in. Uh, so can we sign up for a traditional IRA and ESA2? And ESA2? Absolutely, you can do an education savings account and traditional IRA um, in any year, and you can make previous year contributions to those as well. There's no inherent big deadline for those. Uh, Nancy asks, I contributed $19,000 of salary deferral to a traditional IRA, uh, to a traditional 401k at work. 
uh, and contributed after-tax salary to an IRA outside of work in 2019. I plan to convert this outside IRA um, IRA to Roth IRA. Will I be taxed on the conversion? Um, a few things that you've said there, uh, unfortunately, are a little bit counterintuitive. Um, if you contributed after-tax salary to an IRA outside of work, that would be a Roth IRA already. So if you contributed after-tax, that's Roth. Um, if you indeed did contribute pre-tax to an IRA outside of work, then yes, you could convert that because that would be a traditional IRA. So that's that's easy enough. Um, you will be taxed on the conversion if you convert from the traditional to the Roth. But from what it sounds like, if indeed you did make that as an after-tax uh, IRA contribution, then there's no need to convert it because it's already a Roth IRA. Dale asked, what if the Schedule C is only earned income? Well, absolutely. If it's only um, earned income, then you can certainly contribute uh, your limits on that. That's certainly qualifying. The only one that may or may not be qualifying is Schedule E income. Uh, Randy asks, so the 19000 is non-Roth and the $34,000 can be Roth. Uh, that's that's the flip. So the $19,000 can be made as a Roth contribution, 19 or 24, depending, uh, or 25, depending on your age. Um, and then the 35 can be made, um, always has to be made pre-tax, but you can convert that immediately after making it. So there's the uh, employer contribution, which is the profit sharing, which is the NOI contribution of $35,000. And then there's the elective deferral contribution, which is the personal one, which is the 19 or 25, which can be made either deductible or non-deductible, unlike the employer, which always initially has to be made deductible, but can be immediately converted. Okay, say the client has $75,000 in Schedule C net income. Can he do the 19 plus 25, 19, 25 plus a 25% match? That's going to be a little bit determinant on if this is self-employment income um, and the 75 is indicative of it being, is indicative of, of, of basically the net operating income of the business. So if he's kind of treating it as a Schedule C and just passing everything on and 75K is Schedule C net income, which is also, you know, quote unquote, the net operating income of his business activity. Yes, he can do $19,000 or $25,000 of um, elective deferral compensation into that and then also do a 25% match um, of the net operating income of that, but he's also gonna to need to look at here, she's gonna to need to look at whether or not that they are considering payrolls as an accounting item for uh, expenses. So if the payroll is expense, they're need to going to be looking at that from an accounting perspective of saying, okay, so after he has paid himself and then deferred a portion of that compensation into a plan, then that number is gonna be a lot smaller that you're basing the 35% uh, the NOI calculation on. Well, yeah, no other employees, but but essentially, if that 75k um, is is total payment and he defers a portion of the uh, it, an elective deferral, then he might have an issue with using 75 as the calculable amount for the uh, the profit sharing match. It might be you know it might be 75 minus 19, and then he's calculating a slightly smaller number. Um, but in either regard, he can still make both contributions. Um, I, you know, we cannot give tax or legal advice to the specificities of that one, um, but he is still, you know, able to make both contributions. Um, so another important deadline um, <laughs> to kind of uh, bring this back for a little bit of a landing. Um, I, I do love these questions, so please do keep them coming in. Um, another very important deadline for 401ks is that although you do have the ability to make next year contributions, if you want to make a previous year contribution for a 401k plan that plan has to at least have been adopted meaning that you as the business owner or operator or, or what have you have to at least sign on the dotted line and say yes i am going to be adopting this plan in the given year so that means by december 31st i need to go through the paperwork with you to at least open that plan you have you don't have to make any contribution to the plan you can do that in the next year, but you have to at least open it in this given year in order to be eligible to make a contribution for the given year uh, in, in, into the next year. So that's very important to, to, to understand. 
how many times, uh, Gwai asks, how many times can I do a conversion per year? One time per year, is that limitation applied to 401ks and IRAs? There is no limit on the amount of conversions, uh, whether that be in frequency or value. So you can do as many as you'd like. Um, I have clients that do them quarterly. Uh, you know, different people have different uh, ways that they calculate their taxes. So if you want to do multiple ones, that's fine. But keep in mind that it's only going, you, although you can do four or 10 conversions in a given year, you're just going to get one 1099 in the beginning of the next year showing the total amount of conversions that you did for that year. It's not going to necessarily be counted on a case by case basis because remember, it's just a total amount of income that you're claiming in a given year. And you can effectively do a Roth conversion multiple times throughout a year. And in some strategies, let's say if you're doing conversions of property and you're trying to uh, account for net earnings attributable to a Roth basis in that property, uh, there might be some merit to doing multiple small ones and some additional calculations you might have to do. But, um, you know, that that's kind of another conversation for another day with regards to that specific instance. But at the end of the day, you can do as many as you would like. And um, depending on your strategy for doing some of these, uh, there can certainly certainly be some some different difference in there. Uh, now, moving on from the uh, the ESA and the HSAs, um, we're a little bit past the, the deadlines for HSAs, uh, even though open enrollment was extended an extra, extra day. Uh, if you wanted to make a full contribution for this year, you had to have your um, high deductible health care plan uh, bound by December 1st, or you had to have it bound and then also make the contribution by um, December 1st, that's called the first day of the last month rule. So that one's a little bit past, but you can still, you know, open up an HSA. Uh, you know, you would need to open up the healthcare plan today if you don't have HSA qualifying healthcare coverage. Uh, and then next year, you can make a full year contribution uh, January 1, if you'd like to, of the uh, 35 or $7,000 to those plans. So again, you need to have the plan open by December 31st, December 31st for the 2019 contributions. You can make these into the next year. So just to kind of reiterate, because I know I, I kind of jumped around a little bit, uh, you still are allowed to contribute for 2020 and in 2020 for 2019, so long as that you have the documents for the adoption of that plan dated by December 31st. You can contribute to the plan up to the extended filing deadline for profit sharing. So that 35% of NOI can be contributed up until your extended corporate filing deadline, but the salary deferral, so that 19 or $25,000 has to be made by January 31st, because that is going to be um, a, a deferral of compensation for, for that given year. So you can't defer the compensation that you paid yourself in 2019 all the way up into October of uh, 2020. Okay, uh, Richard, ESA contributions are not tax deductible and the adjusted gross income limits uh, for the phase outs on those are going to be, oh, they are different. And honestly, I, I feel bad. I don't know them exactly, but the uh, the kind of workaround for that, even if you, if you don't um, qualify for making an ESA contribution, uh, it really doesn't matter too much how much money you make for an ESA contribution because the limit for contributing to one of those plans is $2,000 per year per beneficiary. And what you can do, since it's such a low contribution amount, you can gift $2,000 to an individual that does not make a lot of money. Let's say you have parents that are on Social Security and make very little money or a friend or the mailman even. Anyone can make a contribution to anyone's ESA so long as they meet the um, limitations of income requirements. So you can gift someone the $2,000. They can turn around and write a check right back to your child's ESA. Uh, and, and there's no difference to that. It's kind of a strange loophole, but it's above board. And you know, I have clients that are a little bit higher earners that do that exact same thing. So um, although I feel bad for not knowing the income limitation phase out exact numbers, uh, I seem to believe they're relatively similar to uh, the Roth phase outs. Um, it's relatively easy to work around with regards to making those contributions to an ESA if you'd like. <clears throat> okay, so Roth conversions. There are strategies with these. And unfortunately, with it being 
uh, so late in the month, uh, depending on what you're looking to do, you might be on a little bit of a time crunch with regard to uh, any strategies that you'd like to employ with regard to the Roth conversion. Now, again, I know I've harped on it, but it is very important to remember there is no such thing as a previous year Roth conversion. Now, with regard to strategies, if you are just in a cash position or you sell some securities and do a Roth conversion, it's really easy to look at. It's just dollar in, dollar out, dollar for dollar. That is what you converted. That's going to be the increase in the income that you calculate on your tax return. But you don't have to only do them in cash. You can do a conversion of assets. You don't have to, and there is no kind of limitation on the type of asset that can be converted. However, the asset being converted does have to be something that can have a certifiable appraised value. So if you are invested in something that can't get a readily identifiable value or is hard to value, that might kind of limit your ability to do a conversion of that. But for the context of this conversation, let's assume that you have a piece of real estate or a promissory note or something that can readily identify the value. Essentially, the way it works is that you have an appraisal done of that particular asset. So in real estate, it would be a property appraisal. You'd have a quick claim deed drafted that would convey the property from the traditional IRA into the Roth IRA. And then we in turn execute a Roth conversion for whatever portion or the whole value of that property and then move it from the traditional to the Roth IRA. So that way, even if you had zero cash in there, you would still get, let's say, $100,000, 1099 for the $100,000 property you converted. And then any income, whether it be from rentals or the appreciable gain in equity at the sale, would go directly back into that account, just like in the traditional, without any taxes being paid. But the added benefit is that once you're 59 and a half and the account's been open for five years, then you get completely tax-free distributions from that account. Now, when talking about property, man, that does sound attractive, but there is a big downside in the fact that most real estate is relatively valuable. Um, you know, it's there's really no such thing as kind of doing uh, buying a, a $300 piece of real estate that you're going to convert. It's going to be sizable amounts, tens or hundreds or millions of dollars uh, when you're talking about possibly trying to get one of those into a Roth. Well, how do you reduce that liability? Well, there's a couple different ways you can do it. With people that own real estate, the most common method that I see people employing, and I've helped clients with this, is that with it being the end of the year, Remember that first statement, the one I keep talking about. Roth conversions are counted in the year in which they occur. Well, from a taxing perspective, January 31st and January 2nd are two completely different years for when it comes to uh, factoring taxable liabilities. But in reality, it's only two business days different. So if you wanted to count a Roth conversion over two separate years, you really can do it in the span of a few days with, with it being the end of the year, which is a very powerful tool for getting stuff done quickly, but counting it over the course of two years. So what a lot of clients will do with the Roth conversion of property is we'll go through the process in the beginning of the month of working to get the property appraised, getting the legal documents done for the actual quick claim of the property. And then we will wait until the week before. So you know next week, we'll do the conversion of a portion of the property in that week wait till the 2nd of January, process the conversion of the other portion of it, and the client would complete forms indicating how much of the value they want to convert in each given year. And then two different 1099s will be issued, one for one portion of it, but then essentially the property is wholly based into the Roth IRA within a few days as opposed to having to wait a full 365 days to do it. So that's a very powerful tool. Now, if you're doing something like real estate, you know, there's really not any way to, to do it besides just saying, hey, I'm going to take a little bit more of the value this year than in next year. However, a lot of clients like to use, utilize checkbook control with their IRAs where they will have the IRA invested into an LLC or a trust or just some type of entity that will in turn hold title to that particular property. Now, this is especially interesting when it comes to value, because when you value an LLC, even though if it is just a pass through for owning property, there is a lot more that goes into valuing a company than just a piece of real estate, even if it is a single member LLC. So in this case, you have a little bit more of a creative accounting and valuation model that can be used. And again, you do need to get with a qualified individual to help you do this or determine if it even is feasible for what you're doing. But inherently, the principle is that if you were to sell 
less than a controlling interest in a company, that would be slightly less valuable than if you owned a controlling interest. So let's say you were to sell 48% of a company. Well, it's not as valuable as 50 or 51%. It's going to be less than even 48% of that company. So there is modeling that can be done to say that if you have less room in a given year to value a conversion, you can take a you potentially can take a discount for a non-controlling interest in an LLC and convert at an even lower rate of taxation or even lower value. And then in the following year, at the same way that you're splitting your liability over two years, potentially take a take the remaining controlling interest in the next year, helping you to kind of um, utilize um, a, a reduced or a discounted model for that. Now, again, that is something that really is only applicable to entities, so trusts and LLCs. Uh, it does not apply to everyone, but I've seen clients and, and CPAs work it where the tax advisor um, you know, approved of it and, and it definitely worked and they were able to save some of the value claim on that particular conversion. Okay, Randy asks, I had a high deductible plan for all of 2019 and was going to open and fund $7,000 into an HSA. Are you saying 12 was a deadline? So now 7,000 will be my 20 contribution. No, uh, Randy, so the, the way it works is that if you opened a high deductible healthcare plan November 25th, right? You can make a full $7,000 contribution for 2019, so long as you do it by December 1st. Now, that's just kind of a weird rule because um, healthcare plans are, there's only certain times that you can sign up for them. If you had a high deductible healthcare plan for 2019, uh, you can make that HSA contribution for 2019 up until your extended filing deadline. Uh, you know, you have the ability to make those HSA contributions um, very flexible. So uh, just, just keep that in mind. That's only for individuals that are just signing up for HDHPs in a given year is that you can make the whole year contribution even though you weren't covered in the entire year um, by, by December uh, 21 or by December 1st. The only way that that would change is that um, if you waited past that deadline and only had coverage for let's say eight months out of the year, you could only do a pro rata uh, contribution to that plan. Um, HSAs are another big rabbit hole that doesn't have a whole lot of bearing on year end stuff, but I do teach a class on it. Uh, if you want some more information, either give me a call or check out that YouTube video and it has a lot of great information on just HSA stuff. Um, so again, so getting back to this, so remember that you can do a lot of Roth conversions if you'd like. You can do them um, with as much value or as little value as you'd like. There is no income limitation to Roth IRA phase outs. And with the end of the year, although there is a hard deadline for it, it can be a great way to reduce your tax burden by splitting the Roth conversion over two years by really only utilizing several days. So <clears throat> although you do have to claim it in the given year, that can actually be a good benefit to you with the end of the year to convert a little at one time and then another time. And then you have the total conversion contributed over two separate years done in a very short amount of time. So a lot of different ways to save. <clears throat> um, these are just kind of some uh, some some points that we've we've already uh, we've already gone over. But let me cover a few that we haven't. So the the big one that we have not covered is how Roth conversion tax liabilities are paid. So when you convert to a Roth IRA or you convert into a solo 401k Roth, you have to pay taxes on the amount that you're converting of the value. Now that is essentially typically going to mean you're going to have to pay taxes either out of your own out of cash or you know it's going to offset the amount of return that you might be getting but remember this is personal income that you're claiming the amount of that of that conversion is not a taxation to the ira the ira is not filing a tax return it is going towards your personal tax return so any liability that would need to be paid or adjustments and credits that need to be applied is done on the personal side when you file your 1040 it has no bearing on the actual assets um, on the actual account's ability to pay, since it is you that is incurring that liability. 401k contributions, remember that they are going to be two-part. They're going to be filed out of your income that you are paid out of the business activity for that 401k, and a corporate contribution, which is going to be 25% of NOI, not to exceed 35 grand. Roth conversions can only be done and counted in the given year 
for that they are done. And in some cases, you might be able to use a discount valuation model or split it over the course of two years. Uh, you can establish a solo 401k for a side business and you can have multiple 401ks cover you at one time. Your contribution, your conversions are not going to be limited by your income. So unlike with direct Roth IRA contributions or HSA or ESA contributions, you are not limited by the amount of money you earn to make a contribution into one of those plans. So again, I wanna to try to make sure that uh, we don't overload people. Um, although we did almost fill the whole hour with, uh, with presentations, thank you very much for the great questions. If you do have any other questions, again, I personally am uh, kind of the one that's here the most um, throughout the end of the year, but always feel free to give us a call. We are more than happy to have a conversation with you. Keep in mind that if you do wanna learn more about a 401k and get one open before the end of the year, I need at least about an hour of your time on the phone to go through the documentation, get tax ID numbers applied for, and, and make sure everything is properly done before the end of the year. So it's not just a, you know, kind of sit sit down by yourself over coffee and, and get it done in a few minutes. It is a, a very involved packet of paperwork, which I make sure um, to make sure that you understand and, and go through it line by line to make sure that, uh, you know, you leave with as much good information as possible for those, because there is a lot of um, benefits and also liabilities to, or I should say responsibilities to the business and yourself as the operator for those types of uh, for those types of accounts, uh, but that's pretty much it. Uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season, a prosperous and safe New Year's, and uh, you know I'll stick around for a few minutes. If there's any questions, uh, please feel free to ask me or give me a call or shoot me an email at a more convenient time. Again, we very much appreciate you all attending. I I greatly enjoy teaching these classes, so thank you again. Okay, Guai asks, if I open a Roth IRA account and have four conversions, how is the four-year rule calculated? Um, uh, so the five-year rule, so essentially to take a qualified Roth distribution out of a Roth IRA, the account has to be open for at least five years and you have to be 59 and a half. What does that mean? That means that the earnings attributable to any Roth conversions or uh, contributions can't be touched. Now, if you are doing four Roth conversions in a given year, uh, those Roth conversions uh, have to be aged for five years before they can be distributed as a uh, basis in the account, but they don't go from the applicable date. It just goes from, from an IRS's perspective, it looks like that you did all conversions January 1 of that year. You don't have to track each independent date with regards to how long it takes each one of those to be considered a contribution and always penalty penalty free distribution regardless of age. My pleasure. Well, if it doesn't look like that we have any other questions filing in, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. Again, thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Have a great holiday and a happy New